Um, we are live from Israel, and next door to me, Michael Galinsky is in North Carolina, USA, East Coast. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. This is TMS Roundtable Israel. We are about healing chronic pain and autoimmune disease. And um, Rose and I are doing a few different shows each month. And so sometimes I'm alone, sometimes she's alone. Next week we'll be together. Um, just to regarding the time zones and our own sleep patterns. And um, hey, Scotty. So here comes Michael Galinsky. And um, yeah. we're happy to always have you here. You are the pillar, pillar. So I'll, I'll do a little, a little pregame and I'll say that, um, you know, usually we have some great topics with Michael or we have another guest coming. Um, and so the topic is more or less understood, but this time I asked Michael, what do you want to talk about? And I knew it was going to be hot and spicy and it's like to the heart. It's like the most heartfelt, greatest, uh, uh, um, insight that anyone could ever have about chronic pain, healing chronic pain. And I'm really happy to have you here by my side. So besides that you grew up as a twin, which is a whole nother, like, what's that about? The story of all the rage was about your, your life and about many people's life. And it was about the condition of being human. And you say it so brilliantly. So here you go. Tell us. Tell us about being human and how we can bear it. How can we bear it? Well, I'll just say that one of the first things every louder, time we do a little screening, bit louder. I think you might need your headphones, okay. maybe. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll just talk loud. Is that better? Okay. Let's yeah. See so if I what can I hear you every time. We, I don't hear you. Can you hear me? No. No. I don't know why. I'm not muted. Um. um I'm loud. Yeah. Check, check, check. Scotty, check, can check, you check. hear Michael? Scotty's listening. Could be my air conditioning. Okay, right. Do you hear me loud? Do you hear me loud? I do. Okay. Uh, if you can bring me headphones. Uh, Fiona's gonna bring me headphones. Can okay. you, can't, you can't hear me? Um, it's slow. Um, okay, Scotty can hear us both, so continue. So what I was saying was, every time I do a screening of all the rage, uh, one of the first comments is, oh, are, are you better? And I, I, my response is always, well, I have this, you know, um, fatal disease called being human. And it, it's going to get you in the end. And it's contagious. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the idea is that, yes, you know, we are human. And, and we have to remember that because you know, one, one of the, um, the failings of being human is we want to be perfect and we can't be. And so when the we learn to accept that we can't, can't be, be in the same room. Exactly. <laughs> you can chase perfect, but you'll never catch that motherfucker. Right. And, um, so, so the idea of it is, I just really think a lot about that is just kind of, um, empathy, grace, and compassion for oneself, because if you can't be compassionate for yourself, you, you just, you can't be compassionate with anyone Can you else, say that right? again? It, that sounds like new age. What does compassion have to do with healing? It has everything to do with healing, right? Because if you can't have grace for yourself for the, if, if, if say you make a mistake and you go, why did you do that? Like, is that going to solve the problem? Is that going to make you do it better the next time? Absolutely not. So like, it's the same with your children. If you do that with your children, you, 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 you kind of get on them for doing something wrong rather than gently nudging them in the right direction, you're you're not gonna make better people. You're gonna not make perfect people. You're gonna make more imperfect people. And so the closer we wanna get to being perfect, we have to give ourselves grace. But that's also a balancing act, right? Like, cause if our grace means I'm not gonna push myself at all, that's not gonna get you where, anywhere either. It's about being all in all the time. And by being all in all the time means being really present and being aware of what's going on and, and not giving up on things just and, because they're And different. forgiving yourself if you're not in all the time because it is about balance. So I'm, my goal is to be in all the time, to be mindful, 
and to be enormously con compassionate and forgiving if I fuck up. Right. I mean, that's that's tree pose right there, right? It's your leg against your foot holding you in balance, right? And, and the idea is not that you push really hard with both of them. It's that you push in equal measure, right? Like if you're pushing really hard, you won't be able to sustain it. And if you don't push, if you push harder in one direction, you're going to get out of balance. So it's really about finding that that space in between where you're, it is all in, always present, because when you're present, you're not pushing. But, you know, it's just, it's just, it's a complicated thing, but it's very, it's also very simple. Yeah. Yeah. So you, because I, that's one of your phrases about we are, you know, we are human and it's a condition, but where did you learn that? Where did you feel that? What, when did you begin to realize that was the healing to accept that reality? I don't know. I can't remember, but I think it came out of this long process of starting to realize that. I, I, I talk about this a lot, but it was Dr. You know, Gabor Mate who said to me, hey, you need to read A New Earth. Because I, I commented on something that he'd written and about um, something, and he was like, I think this is where you, you're going to get that information. And that was really foundational. It was a big shift for me because the whole point of what I got from it was, you know, your parents – they were doing the best that they could. Even if they were highly and terribly abusive to you, they were obviously, we're always doing the best that we can, right? It may not mean that it's good enough, but it's the best that we can. So if you're mad at somebody for, for doing the best that they can, that's not really gonna serve you or them, right? You're not, it's not gonna improve your relationship with them. It's important to recognize that they weren't doing very well, but then when you start to break it down, it's like, how could they? You're like, oh wait, I'm an adult now. And I'm not doing that well. I'm not doing as well as I might like. I'm screwing up. And then you start to see how giving them some space and not holding that anger. Because like a lot of times with our parents, um, we'll engage with them, but we'll have a wall of defense up because they've they've done so many bad things. They've done so wrong to us. And this is, you know, this is our experience of it, right? But when we let down the guard and we go, oh wait they're imperfect and they're doing the best they can. And they have their own problems. Instead of being angry about them, giving a little bit of space and support for that allows that relationship to flourish. It doesn't automatically make it flourish, but it makes a space for that to happen. At the end of the day also, if you give them that space and they don't do anything with it, then you recognize, oh wait, maybe I need to have actually more real distance, not just be with them and have that boundary up. Like just pull back a little bit. and. That doesn't mean cut them off unless that's what you need for yourself, but with the goal maybe of trying to figure out how, how can I re-engage, you know? It, it, this is all really complex. I'm just talking about on a human scale level because there's other people in my life that I do have to like have boundaries up around. Otherwise I'll get pulled into right. negative patterns or I'll, they don't make it possible to, to be who you are. And then you're right. like, okay, so this is, that's and fine. this is all equally. I mean, like the bottom line is we're sound like we're talking about, you know, human behavior, but we're really talking about the dance with human behavior equal causes chronic, the, you know, equals chronic pain. Right. But, but linked in with um, relationships. So it's human behavior and human relationships. And so if my human behavior doesn't work very well with your human expectation of behavior, maybe we don't need to work together. And part of the problem is, is we often develop um, patterns that aren't very good for us because that's what the adults needed, right? Mm -hmm. And so if what happens, we actually start to repeat those patterns because those feel normal in the way we need to be in the world. And you relate to it. And so you're like, okay, I know how to fit into this. I, I keep always going back to the big O, you know, that uh, Shel Silverstein book where yes. you have the big O and the missing piece. And then there's one that's missing a piece and that missing piece fits in there and then they go along but when the missing piece starts to benefit from that relationship and grow you know then the the circle can't spin anymore and it spits it out and that's a good example of those relationships where if you challenge the expectation maybe that ends the relationship and that's very difficult when there are family relationships right but sometimes we have to do that as well right well let's relate the let's relate all the relationships to how we relate to ourselves and our pain and how that becomes chronic, how, how 
you know, what is your take home tool today for what does my relationship have to do with my vein? Right, right. Um, the take home tool is when you start to realize that that's a problem within your core relationships, that you are repressing parts about yourself because it's not acceptable within that relationship. That is probably the most fraught space in the healing process because it's a really, really subtle dance of how to address that. So the first step is, oh, I don't have to respond in the way that they want me to. But then being able to address that in a thoughtful way isn't that easy because we're still very reactive. And so then we feel righteous and like, no, you can't do that. And then you push into the space. And if the person isn't willing to work with you, you're going to have problems. So that's where you maybe create some distance. Yeah. Well, you maybe create distance and then they're like, oh, you just think you're so, so, and so. And so now that's ego. They don't want so to then it's ego that's causing us pain. Well, it's, it's both. It's also our human, like, so it's our ego is causing us pain because we want to be right. We want to win or whatever. Uh, but it's also that the other person's forcing us back into the hole that they dug for us. But nobody so forces it's us. Just a very nobody fraught. forces us, but we feel, nobody for- when we're children, they do. We don't have an option. Well, like, do you yes. want to, do you want to eat? Then you're going to follow my rules. And and this comes back to this other thing. I I, I this is something I had wanted to talk about. So I'm going to shift to it a little bit, but it's completely related. When I was in my early 30s, I tried to write a book with my dad called Transitions, right. and it was about the fact that in our culture, we no longer have the same kind of um, deeply embedded rituals that allow us to do state changes. And so, rich, like I, I, I studied anthropology kind of, like I ended up as a religious studies major because I was interested in the classes because I didn't have that in my life, right? I didn't, we, did, we were not a religious family, but I was interested in what those stories were. And one of the things you find in all these cultures, you have transition rituals. You have bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and confirmations. And these are these are milestones. Some transition milestones. They are rituals in which the community comes together and says, "You are going from this state to this state, and now we recognize you as an adult. You were in the world of adults before you were in the world of children, and now you must act like an adult." And it's not like for everybody, it's like wazang, and now I'm an adult. But that process is important, and and there is it is a transformation of the mind and the body. Now I'm in this world, and it. The problem is if we don't have those, like I I think about this a lot in our culture, you go off to college and you change significantly and you come home and parents are often like, oh, look at you, Mr. Big Britches. Now you think you know everything, right? And they kind of infantilize you and they don't allow you to grow into your adulthood. And so that's what I I was having with my dad. He was like, you need to do adulthood this way. And I'm like, that's not the way I want to do adulthood. You know, that's not the way. And I, I had to forge my own path without kind of support. And we got to a place where he was respecting what I was doing, but I was like, you know, I think the way that we dealt with this was problematic. Why don't we write a book together about how to do that? And working on that was useful for our relationship, but he was still very stuck in his academic mindset of, as Erickson wrote about the seven stages, you know, I was like, dude, that's not what this is, you know, but he wouldn't let go. And we, we eventually couldn't do it. Now, he also wrote the most incredible speech for our wedding, which is foundational to the movie. And my daughter wants to get that tattooed on her arm, part of it. But so oh, my she, God. The, 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 the last saying about yes, being an um, actor. Yeah, be not, don't be actor. You know, you, you know, be authentic. Essentially, be, be, the, you know, no, be the actor. Don't, don't delude yourself into thinking that you're Romeo or Juliet. You're the character actor because that's the one that you need to play because it's not so stuck in some expectation, right. essentially. And so she wanted to get it. So she said, do you have any of his handwriting? And what I do is when he passed away, his graduate student brought me all of his notes because she'd been typing them up for him on the book that we were trying to do together. Oh, wow. So I pulled that out yesterday and I gave it to Fiona. But I was like, actually, Fiona and I just went um, to work on this film project. She dropped out of college because it wasn't right for her, having a lot of trouble with it. But she came on this trip and she was really lost. And she came to work on this project and we worked together and that was a transition. She's wow. in a much better place. Wow. And it was that process. So we were able to do that much better than my father and I were. But it was interesting Amazing. to to um, see that and, and kind of like uh, hand her that. But then it gets more interesting, right? 
because I have this incredibly um, beautiful thing in my life where I have this other daughter who I didn't bring up, but she's my daughter. And so we didn't have any baggage. So we, in the last three years, we have gone through that transition from kind of a father and kind of a daughter and, and figuring that out to now being really good friends. Um, and I was thinking, actually, the three of us need to kind of write a new book based on that book and include my dad's work in it. And the whole point is, like, my dad, he was a psychologist. He didn't really do the work. He just didn't. You know, he was cured by Dr. Sarno because he understood it, but he didn't do the deeper part of it, I don't believe. I don't think he really- When his pain came back, his pain was never went away. His pain went away, but when he retired, as is often happens, see, my dad was kind of the longest serving head of the department in the psychology department at UNC. No one wants to do it for more than a year or two. But my dad liked being in control and he was very good at it. And he liked having that. When he left, he didn't have that anymore, right? And so it was complicated and he lost something of himself, right? And then he started to get all these uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, maybe ALS, they didn't know what was going on. So the point being like, I look back and like even our process of trying to do that transition, he never, he didn't do the transition. We got closer, we understood each other a little bit better. He still wanted to be in control. He still wanted to have power. What did he, when you when you came home and said, I have pet back pain, what was like, how did he, like, did he tell you? Did he talk at you or did he like take your hand? Was he compassionate? Well, Michael, I understand what you're going through. You know, I don't think he was a psychologist as much as he was a, a parent. And so, you know, he definitely, you know, said, go, go see Dr. Sarno, see, read the book. I don't want to paint him as not being a, a wonderful and beautiful and loving human being. I think he had a lot of trauma growing up and a lot of people become psychologists or social workers because they want to help people, but also because they don't really want to deal with their own shit. And my mom was the same way. No, none of us do. Right. I don't like, it's really hard. And so what I'm saying is I looking back at this and I started that process of trying to kind of work that with him. And, and then I, you know, I had children, it wasn't easy. And I had a lot of difficulty relating with my daughter at times, you know, she's a very hard headed person. But doing the ritual of going on this job together, it was a ritual. It was an intense, it was a battle, right? Very bonding and very transformative. And it worked. And so our relationship is dramatically shifted in the last four months. Wow. Because of that. And so that that prompted me when I handed her the book for the writing to be like, hey, maybe we should revisit that. And then later I was like, oh, Holly, wow. You know, we had a long, great conversation about it last night. Right. Just how intense that kind of that idea is right. um, of what what is parenting? Uh -huh. What and you know, you have these ideas based on okay, I'm going to nurture, but then there's that nature, and nature is, I mean, 10x mm -hmm. over nature right. in terms of how we become who we are. And so we think, oh, if I just do this right, and if I shift my behavior, yeah, that's going to shift. But this this. This shit is in our genes. It is not well, like that, something. That, I want to. I want to look. I want to. You know. I want to give hope to some people because you know a few weeks ago Rose and I came on the show and talked about. She remembered the statistic. I think it was Trubiner said, "Well, you know, sixty percent of the people get well." And so Rose was like, "What about the forty percent?" And so we started to talk about those forty percent because they're they're the people that are not going deep enough. They're the people because everyone can heal. Not everybody will heal, but everybody can have a miracle. Not everybody will have a miracle, but everybody right. is, is, his birthright is to be healthy. So right. can we address together the, the people that are struggling because, you know, they're the ones go like, they, you know, they'll text me, what, how about this process? How about this healing? I'm like, it's not the next therapy that's going to help you. And it's because they, it get, it's like, so it's really about, people's bottom line and I know from some of the work personally is you know when the student is ready the teacher will come and if it's dark and uncomfortable and scary you're in the right place yeah so, well that that goes back to what I was saying about that that balance right like I, I was actually just thinking about this idea of comfort and like if you're comfortable 
I mean, we all want to be comfortable, right? But if you're comfortable, you're not growing. You're not challenging yourself. And it, so how do we get to the place where we can rest, recuperate, and go back in? Rest. I have the answer. Yeah, go ahead. This is what I thought. This is what I made this up, but I think it's nothing is new. Let your, we don't like go, we don't like going out of our comfort zone. If we're aware that we're not in our comfort zone and that becomes our new comfort zone, let's all continually push ourselves out of our comfort zone, be aware that I'm not comfortable and be label that comfortable. Yeah. A new level of comfort is to be slightly uncomfortable. I love that. And, and I mean, that's the whole Wim Hof thing, right? You get in the water and you realize, oh, this isn't going to kill me. This isn't dangerous because comfort is also, I think, related in our brains to safety. And so um, we want to be safe and to be comfortable oftentimes feel safe, but it may not be that safe. It may be instead um, unsafe in a way that we don't understand because it keeps us stuck like our desire to be comfortable and not push ourselves and not challenge ourselves. And I go back again to, you know, tree pose, right? Like I have one leg that is profoundly weaker than the other leg. Your left. My left leg is, is a hot mess. I remember from the movie. And it still is, it's still weaker. It's like my, and my ankle is much thinner. I mean, it, there's a physical difference between the two. And I struggle with that because I try to make it stronger, but I can't really, you know, there's only so much I can do. And yet I, there are moments when I can get into tree pros on the left side and I find the balance and I can, I can stay there. And then there's some days that I can't. And so the grace is understanding that that doesn't mean I failed, but the days that I can't do it are the most uncomfortable. And those are the ones that you learn the most from. Yeah. Right. And, and it's really, that's the disease of being human, which is that we are going to be uncomfortable a lot of the time. And the, the medicine is learning to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable to the point, like you just said, that that becomes okay. And if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing and changing and expanding. And so it's like, you know, when you, when you exercise really hard, you, you don't injure yourself, but you are sore the next day. That's normal. And if our brain goes, oh, that's not, that's not safe. And we're safe, but if you get up and you're like, "Oh, good, I'm sore," that means I really pushed myself. I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm happy that I found that place of discomfort. But keeping that within balance, not like okay, what, we're now doing, so what we're doing is we're we're really. I think the work of John Sarno and the work of some of our colleagues are so challenging that what we think is normal. I mean, we grew up thinking pain is bad, anxiety is bad stress is bad like we have to undo these pathways you know and create new ones and it is i don't want to call it a struggle it's a climb it's an embracement it's it's a human condition and this is what we should be teaching you know this is what we should be learning yeah but it, but it gets confusing like even when you said like anxiety is bad or stress is bad they're not on their on their face bad but chronic anxiety is not good for your health. So it's not that like you're like, I mean, we do, we often, like I remember when I was in college, I would wake up most mornings being like, kind of not in a panic attack, but like, oh, I, you know, just feeling, I didn't have a word for it, but I was feeling anxious, but I didn't understand why. Cause I knew I'd done this. I knew what I had to do. I always felt like there was something I was missing. Sometimes there was, and sometimes I wasn't or, um, but I didn't even have a word for it. And so, once I had a word for it, it didn't really help. But later, I was able to go, okay, this doesn't matter that much. Or what does matter? And being able, but it takes effort to sit in the uncomfortable truth that, well, maybe it doesn't matter if I do this thing. Or it doesn't really matter. But you don't want to disregard just to feel more comfortable. You want to figure out what's important to you and what's important for your life. And these are not easy things to figure out because they require a lot of thought and a lot of decision making. Okay, I'm playing devil's well. advocate, yeah. but I'm in excruciating pain and it gets worse sometimes. I can deal with it when the pain is okay. I can, you know, I can self-soothe, 
But when the pain is really high, I, I, I don't know what to do. Right. So that would be, you feel panicky. And so the first thing you need to do, and Dr. Sona would say this, if your pain's really high and you can't function, you know, take some, take something for the pain, get to a place where you're not panicked and you can think a little more clearly and then try to get back down to a stasis where. What so, what's going to say the, the strong pain is also just your brain. There's no threat. I mean, that's where, that's where PRT came from. Pain reprocessing. Um, so that that is a really, really difficult place to be in. It's really difficult, and it, you can't, you but know, we're causing says, our own pain. Our body's causing it for a reason, right? But when you're in that much pain, you can't hear what you just said. In fact, it's enraging, right? So, how do we, you know, if we want to help someone, how do we help them? And like you just said, you know, did your dad say, is it all right? You know, did he, you know, touch you and calm you down? Because you know that that's what we need. We need human connection. We need someone to help us see that we are okay. And by that, I mean, not that the pain isn't bad, but that we're going to be okay, that we are worthy of attention and love. Um, and those can be very confusing because you may have been taught that you are not worthy of it. And so if you get attention and love, that can be kind of terrifying, right? Um, and it, it's complicated. All this stuff is so complicated. And the problem is, I think oftentimes when we speak about it, we want to simplify it so people feel like it's possible. It's possible and it's complicated. And, uh, I don't want to tell people you're going to flip the switch and everything's going to be better. You may flip a switch and you will be on the right path, but that path will not end. That path goes somewhere, right? And that path is going to be winding. And you're going to come back to it, and you're going to go back to science. There's, you know, there's the Joe Dispenza work. There's the the work of, you know, if I'm resonating, like, like, I had someone, you know, today who really felt like she wanted to kill herself, and I mean, I think, you know, she just said, like, what do I do? And after ten minutes of talking, she felt hope. So I think even what you're saying is that there's this resonate resonation, like Joe Dispenza calls it resonating or um i forget what the word he calls it but it's like you start to bring the positive and then you can tap into it more like she was able to grab into the positive much quicker than a few weeks ago because like we got to it quicker because and then i know that even over the years i've been working if i say well you just have to have the biology belief but it's not easy to believe what taught me to believe who taught me to believe but, it, but it's a practice, right? We talk about a practice, just like you practice basketball. Nobody picks up a basketball and knows how to shoot a basketball. And what's interesting is if you look at the level of play in like basketball in the world now, I, I mean, it's worlds beyond what it was when we were when I was a child, right? Because not only um, do people start playing earlier, but they see people do things that no one could have even imagined 10 years ago. Like, and so by seeing it, you can imagine it and you can believe it and you, you can become it. But you can't do that without practice and discipline and uh, attention, right? And so, you know, the, the project that I was working on that I worked on with Fiona was about this baseball team called the Savannah Bananas. And it's very real baseball, but it's also very much about entertainment and it's kind of a circus. But you're finding this balance between all of this. And one of the problems with baseball in general, it takes itself too seriously and the rules are so so rigid. So it's very confining and controlling. So the players here, they dance and the people who dance and, and have fun actually play better baseball. So that's a fact, right? But there's all these things that are going on at the same time. Information about what we see as possible, actions that becomes more possible. When we practice something, we may not notice that we've gotten better until we look back at a tape of ourselves a month earlier and you're like, oh, wow, I really have improved, but it becomes incremental. And I guess that's what I'm, I'm, I'm really what I'm saying is the, the medicine is understanding that if you want to get somewhere, you have to go somewhere. And to go somewhere, you have to put one foot in front of the other. And if you're going to go somewhere, you have to believe that you can get somewhere. And if you're going to get somewhere, you have to believe you're going to get there. Because if you don't believe, you won't go. And so at its core, if you want to get better, you have to know that you will get better. 
and you have to let go of any expectation that it's going to happen that's, in your old that's time. The, that's the thing that's the, that's a biggie it's the you know the independence outcome is to like what is your goal no pain or just to be able to drive a little bit and get to work like what isn't can we have a goal goals are good of calming the brain down if pain or not i'm calming the brain down i'm learning a habit automatic we get up and brush our teeth we get up and do everything we want to do but the habit of calming our brain is something we haven't learned and so the point i'm making is that what what you know how the people that we've met that have gotten better you know and we're not going to have a discussion about people who read the book and got better we're having a discussion about people who i, I just after these last two years I, I can't even believe what i've been through meeting people from the both round tables and the kind of healing that's happened and the and what do they all have in common they took responsibility they didn't give up there was a will there was a human will so the human condition can work for us or against us aha well i, I mean it's interesting that you what you just brought up because i'll say here's a, here's a, it's like think big go small right know what your end goal is but don't think you're going to get to the end goal immediately and i think like what you're doing is a very a very profound example of that right like you have you said i'm going to do this show i don't care if anybody watches i'm just going to do it i'm going to make it happen so you did one show and then you did two shows and then you did three shows and then you screwed up and then you fixed it and then you changed it and you kept moving forward and you know in that time you like told me i, I was being a victim i told you that that's about the other thing i talked to you about i mean oh, we, we, I, I probably did but you needed to hear it because it was probably true perfect and I'm human. Thing. I have that human thing called being human. It's exactly what I'm talking about. But like you set a goal and you say you, you, you started out at the beginning, right? What do you want? Do you just want to be able to be calmer or do you want to be out of pain? Well, those are two separate goals, but they're completely interrelated. I want to be out of pain. The first step is getting calmer. So I'm going to work on getting calmer. I know that that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen overnight. Right. And I think this is where the storytelling is getting calmer can happen in a minute it can happen in four breaths right and so when we know the tools and some of the tools are go to your breath because your breath connects to your body and your body connects to your brain and your brain connects to your body and they're an inner interlocking loop so once you teach your body how to be calmer your body then learns how to be calmer and it learns how to do it become and i just want to say to, the, to these incredible listeners if you do all that and you still feel stress it's because you're resisting it's not because you're, you're bad or wrong or you failed. It's because the conflict still exists inside of you. And that has to be somehow understood and accepted. Right. That's the end goal. But you're not going to get there until you make many steps on the way. It's like you're not going to hit 100 free throws in a, in a row, probably ever. But if you can hit your first free throw and you learn how to do that, then maybe you put two together, right? Two out of 10. Then maybe you get to five out of 10, right? But you have to both believe and understand that just because you believe it doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. It all takes time. And that's what I was, I was getting at. I think the stories that we tell are really important, right? So if you, you see someone come on and, you know, we still are all very emotionally protective, right? So we may go, oh, I, you know, I was a mess and now I'm not. We're all a mess our whole lives. I mean, honestly, right? We are. And, you know, we want to polish the mirror now and then, but I think it's much more important to be honest and say, wow, I look back and I'm wildly more grounded, more capable, more present than I ever was 10 years ago. I'm still like a fucking goldfish. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just like. Without you know, my fins. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all are, right? And so the problems arise, you readdress them, maybe you do a little better, but the more that you're able to address them for yourselves and the more you're able to help other people address them, the more you're able to own your own role. No. Another, another movie in the making. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I, you can share a few minutes. I imagine that the whole process of all the rage and the whole, all the drama and trauma around it, besides just the film 
and all the amazing things you've done and how it's just, it's, it, it hasn't even slowed down in my life regarding the movie. There's still thousands of people that will see it. There's still thousands of people that will benefit. There's still thousands of people that you will touch. And yet it has been a great drama and trauma for you because of your feelings, because of your connection, because of your relationship with what you did, because of your opinion, because of your politics, because of your, you know, it's been, even though it's something incredible, it's got, because, because we have this condition called being human and we have relationships. We also have systems that have expectations, right? And so if things don't fit the expectation, then it's like you drink milk when you think you're drinking orange juice, you know, and so you spit it out because you're like, wait, what is this? Um, and I think, you know, for me, like, I know the way I want to do something. I'm not going to do it the right way. I'm going to do it the way that seems like it's going to resonate the most. But systems are always going to get in the way of that. And so for me, it's both accepting that. Like, because I wrote recently, like, I just have stopped and I got busy and I stopped engaging on our page and I stopped. Yes, I saw yeah. that. You, yeah, you wrote a lot about the movie and I, 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 like, I felt it and it was just very intense. Yeah. And so I was just like, it's really that other part of accepting. I'm not, I'm, you know, I did the practice. I did the work. I got it going. You know, at a certain point, you need to kick the baby in the ass and let it walk on its own. And if it does, it does. And if it's not, like, okay, have another baby or something. No, but my, that's a very rude way of saying it. But my point is, I, I just kind of have to not be attached to it anymore. Exactly. That's all. That's all. I mean, you were, you're, you know, on some deep level, I think you're hurt. It feels like you're hurt about the way the some people. I, I'm mostly just frustrated because I know that it can help people. But because those systems won't engage with it, I can't reach people. I, I, no matter what I do, I, I'm not able to get it to people. And, and, and by what I say, no matter what I can do, I, you know, I did it for five years. That's basically a good portion of each day was like, how do I get this out in the world? And at a certain point, you just go, I, I can't do that anymore. And it's being sh it's shown in 70 countries. Hasn't it been shown in? Well, it's been seen in probably 95 now. Like just based on Vimeo, like where it's been seen. And today I, I looked and it was watched in Canada, the Netherlands, and Australia today already. So can it feel can it also be that part, that deep, deep part of you that that, you know, when your father called and said, Call me when you have a job, kind of like feeling yeah, deep, deep it, inside. It's a, little, it's a little less than that. It's less of that. It's more of like getting the messages, you know. Oh my God, I'm so glad I found this. It saved my life. I mean, if, if I got one of those, it's all worth it. If you, if you can change someone's life, one person's life, all worth it. And I've got thousands of those. Right. But the problem that I think is, God, there's so many people who need it, but they're not ready for it. They'll get it when they get it. It's fine. And, you know, it's, it's all- I mean, it All really the rage for, was first. This might hurt. Um, the Alan Gordon movie that's coming out, um, I think, doing it. Yes. The, the, I think the, the, the connection with Love Heals, the movie from, I think there's, you, you have no idea that the pioneer and the seeds that you planted from your struggling came. <laughs> no, no, I do. And I'm saying that's what makes it possible to go, okay, it's time to move on. Right. And that's on that's it. Washing my hands of it, but just like, I, I have so much other stuff to do. I need right. to get focused on it. That's all. Right. And your, your, your heartstrings will still be pulled because you're human. I, I, it's a terrible disease and I hope nobody else catches it. <laughs> so, so what's, what's the, can you, can we, you've told us about the placebo. You told us about the medicine and the same thing. Um, you know, it's a, you know, like Dana and, and Hanscom, they all did love heals. Cause like I, I would think, and Hanscom says that, love is like accepting is love like to accept yourself is kind of a love and that's a chemical reaction just like the belief or the the um compassion you know and then this woman who i can't wait to have back bethany she's a professor she taught she did a podcast on um curable and i did not know this but she's saying pain is an emotion it's processed in the same place as anger and shame. And like, I'm like, I'm I, not only is that just a, a calming thing, but it helps you to understand the science behind the art yeah. and the art behind that science. So 
Well, I think actually it's chronic pain tends to happen in the same place as those emotional ones. So there's other pain. Oh, right. like, Rather than, yeah. Than like getting your arm chopped off by a bear, right? right. You know, right. but but that's what's significant, right? It's a different thing. That's what the fMRI show us is, and that when we get, when we do these practices, we calm that part of our brain. It becomes less active. And the compassion part is recognizing, oh, that part of my brain is trying to protect me. But using your cortex to reconnect with your amygdala is really important. It, it's, it's all very difficult and yet it's all very simple. Yeah. That's a paradox. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. So um, I'm trying to think of anything else that I wanted to mention that but I have your attention, which is so wonderful to have. Um, anybody want to ask any questions out there in the audience that Michael's here? Anybody want to um, share anything? Um, I think it'd be good to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I learned from Gabor Matei, Matai, Gabor Matai, I say it correctly, Gabor Matai, Gabor Matai, that, um, you know, at, at birth, oh, next movie, Scotty Steele's, what next movie? Well, the first thing will be the series about the bananas, but I, I definitely want to get to the movie um, about donor conception and adoption. Amazing. And which I've been working on since 2007. And so I just really have to do it. When is and the bananas coming out? Uh, August 19th, it'll be on ESPN. Oh my God. Yeah. It's like a four part series. It's going to be, it's interesting because I think we were the perfect people to do it because basically they're, they're taking a different look at how you do not just baseball, but how you run the business and how you uh, work with each other and how you support each other. So for instance, it's this team, it's a baseball team. And if you Google Savannah Bananas, you'll see that they absolutely blew up in the last six months. Like from, we, we did a short about them for ESPN that got them much more recognition. And then since then, while we were filming, HBO, uh, Fox News, everybody, CBS Sunday Morning did something this weekend. But what they do is they're trying to make baseball fun again, and they, their name of their company is Fans First. But what's really interesting about that is um, it's really very much new ideas, constantly coming up with new ideas, but also a real kind of positive approach to it. So, for instance, after every game, they have a staff meeting, and all they do is they recognize each other for – good things they noticed that other people were doing, right? Like I saw um, there was someone who was struggling and uh, I saw this team member go over and help that person. And, and so that's, that is the DNA of what they do is always do better, be better. And wow. Make better and, and make baseball fun. So that they are, there's actually a study that was done that says if the baseball players are having fun, they play better. And it's very different from what MLB is, right? MLB is be tough no fun, no, you know, it's, it's really different. And so everything they're doing, they're doing right. And they're using social media to do this. And they skipped over everything by building, they had almost a million fans on TikTok when we started filming. Wow. 18, 18 months to get there. Three weeks later, they hit 2 million. Wow. Now they're at 2.7 million. And the, 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 the profound thing about that is they're just sending out these kind of positive, fun little videos. Are they playing baseball professionally? Yes. So they're playing baseball. And, and the baseball is very serious. But there's dancing between every inning. The, oh, my the God. It's going to be a great sport. movie. It's, it's very it's, – it's all about having an experience. And really, what about endorph endorphins? It, it is. It's about having people come and just be locked in to this – constant level of entertainment which can be overwhelming for some people but right. ah, where'd you go where'd michael go anyway he'll be back but linda i want to address your your question and then michael will address it i've taught and helped so many as a facilitator through my life at this time with all my recovery from tms somatic experiencing and spiritual devotion i'm going through <clears throat> that dark night where yes, the new comfort is a huge discomfort. I am grateful to be here now with both of you. I'm glad this is healing. Is there anything specific you wanted to say to Michael? 
Um, Linda, Linda was just sharing about some light and dark, little Leonard Cohen, some light, uh, I have it right here. Ring the bells, it still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. But this is what Linda is. And she's from Canada, I think, where Leonard Cohen's from. And she's um, going through some darkness, but she's liking the new comfort zone, which has got a UN in front of it, the uncomfort zone, the discomfort zone. The dis I have a friend who's, who's healing MS, and she calls it disrupt. Yeah. Disrupt MS, disrupt. We are disrupting. Right. <clears throat> well, it's interesting you, you bring up Leonard Cohen because he actually passed away a couple of days before our premiere of the film. And so while we were in New York, I walked by the Chelsea Hotel where there was a big, uh, I have pictures I took of people leaving things for him in front of the Chelsea Hotel. Uh, wow. It's, it's funny how these things connect, but like, and I hadn't really, yeah, yeah there, was a, there was that interesting connection there. Right. When that happened. right. Well, this is exciting, the, the film that you're doing, and yet it sounds like there's a similar thread, connection, feeling, relationships. It's connection, it's relationship, it's, it's willing to challenge expectation in order to drive change. Wow. And when we do that, um, it's uncomfortable. So well, a lot of people- that. Willing, willing to- um, Drive expectation? No. Well, to, no, to, to challenge expectation challenge. in order to drive change, right? So if we, get, if we get stuck in an expectation, um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna create anything new, right? And I, I think like for me, like, I saw that in academia, right? Like, how are you ever going to get new information if the people in power, like, are not going to accept challenges to their work? Like, you can't go say, hey, will you be my um, thesis advisor? I have uh, an idea about this field that we're in that's completely opposite of what you're doing. I want to get my PhD. Could you help me with that? They'd be like, see ya, you know? And that's why information gets blocked up, you know? Uh, and change is very slow to come because we don't want, if, if we're comfortable, we don't want things to change. Exactly, so when we're back to power, the comfort. Right, when we're in power, we're more comfortable. And that goes back to this idea of transitions. At a certain point, to be a really good parent, you have to let go of power. You have to accept that the people coming up under you have strength and they have knowledge and wisdom that you don't, you don't yet appreciate. And I look back at myself and I recognize like I was, so all the work I've ever done, it never gets appreciated until 20 or 30 years later. And so I kind of knew what I was doing, but I never had any support for it. Um, and that took a lot to kind of stay with it and keep doing it. But like, as an example, like when I was 20 years old, I drove across the country and I took pictures in malls and nobody could give a shit. Right. But now they're the only pictures that exist of people in malls, really. And so was, they, so, they have, so you had to almost have the compassion. You had the vision, but you had to have the compassion that you weren't going to get rewarded now, that there was some reward, that you could do it without the reward. Like the reward was the doing. The reward was the doing, but also where I am now, it gives me more agency to try to support my, my own children and say, I actually do believe in you. And you may not be getting the feedback that you want from the world. And you may, you're not doing great right now. I wasn't doing great. Like I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, but I moved in a direction and I just kept doing it. And if you don't know where you're going, you just have to keep doing, right? You may not know how to heal on this healing journey, but you keep doing and you don't stop. You don't jump to something completely different. You think, how do I shift? How do I challenge what's expected? And how do I just believe in myself? And how do I find that, that grounding? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm saying back to that idea of transitions. Like, you know, my dad was an absolutely wonderful person, an incredible person. Was he the best parent? Probably not. Did he expect us to be little adults with incredible intellectual capacity when we were seven or eight? Yeah. Did he always say, this seems like a 10th grade paper? And I'd be like, dad, I'm in 10th grade. He's like, yeah, but you should be writing like you're a, in graduate school, you know? These unreasonable expectations, if we put them on our children, that's not so fair right but if we can say actually i believe in you and i do expect you to do well and i expect you to challenge yourself they may not like it it may not work but if you just hold to that and hold to that and i believe in you and i believe in you there's this very famous speech 
it's gonna make me cry even thinking about it because it meant a lot to my dad, but Jimmy Valvano, who was the coach of NC State University. And, um, he, you know, his, he kept wanting his dad to come to his game. But his dad wasn't in good health or whatever. And he's like, I got my bags packed for you every time. He couldn't come, but he's, I've got the bags packed. And then Jimmy Valvano won the national championship. And I, and I can't remember if his dad made it or not. But just that idea that his dad believed in him was really powerful to him. And it helped him get there. He died of cancer like two years later, but that's another story. Listen, listen, it's emotional that you're, I mean, your dad died, you know, at a basketball game. Well, on his way to a game, yes, that's true. Anyway, yeah, yeah. but I was going to say on a happy note, would you want to bring some of the banana guys to the show and talk about relationships? And You know, I, I don't know if I could get them to do it. Um, I could try, but I can say they're like, <laughs> No, they may want to be on channel three, not, not TMS round table. Well, no, it's just like, I, I just don't know if it, they'll, they'll fully get it. But one of the coaches of the team is a guy named Eric Burns. And he was a, he played pros for the uh, Oakland A's. And he's now like um, kind of an endurance athlete and he coaches his kids team. So, but he, he's incredible. Like he and this, this guy that he's was an assistant coach, they played 420 holes of golf in 24 hours which means they ran something like 117 miles. It's a world record. But their, their thing is, you know, you're either all in or you're in the way. So if you're going to work with me on something, I need you 100% in it. And, and I think- I wonder that, how he was brought up. <laughs> I, you know, it actually, uh, it's funny, like in a very supportive way. And, but he actually learned to play baseball from an older kid in the neighborhood. It's like sometimes things luck. It's luck, right? Like, so an older kid taught him how to hit b baseballs. And that guy was a pitcher, ended up being like the best pitcher in California. And so when he was a freshman in high school, that guy was a senior. And somehow he got in the game and he got two hits off this guy. And everyone was like, who is this kid? How did this kid do it? They didn't know that he'd learned to hit from this guy. But that gave him this, this incredible advantage because he faced the greatest adversity right off the bat. And he learned how to overcome it. And so then he ended up being a major league player, but he just also has, it's, he was um, like, he's really into the stoic philosophers. And so he's just, he was an incredible, um, that, that was a big thing. So two of the, two, this player coach, Eric Burns, like his way of introducing himself in the game, he'd run around the bases and dive into third head first <laughs> in, in, a in a, in a leopard skin um, puffy fur coat, right? Like all in or in the way. But these philosophies of how to live your life are really intentional. And he was like, we interviewed all these players. Oh, he's a great coach. But more than that, he's really teaching me a lot about life because they're 20, 23 years old. And so they're learning a lot from him as a father figure. Then there's another guy on the team. As it, per, we call it like they they have a bananas way of being. Bill Lee, he was a Boston Red Sox pitcher, pitched in the 75 World Series. He's 75 and he played on the team. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he just has story after story after story. And I think Fiona getting to be around these guys who gave her a lot of amazing knowledge was also mm -hmm. like, oh, you don't have to do it the right way, but you do have to do it the passionate way. If you ever want to achieve anything, you have to be all in. It's all in. Advice. Yeah. Michael, it's great advice. And um, I know it's a busy Monday for you in the middle of the day. And don't you worry, see this face? We're going to have you back. We'll see you again. Yeah. Um, I like I like once a month having coffee with you, but we'll yeah. see what Rose says. But I so appreciate you coming. And I know that you're available on all the rage of people, you know, on the Facebook page. Yeah. If anybody, you know, wants to ask you something or anything, and sometimes people yeah. call me and I connect you. And so you've just yeah. been Always incredible been. support for this show and for Rose and I. And you're just really smart. I, I mean, you know, your girls are lucky, all three of them. And great picture with the two daughters kissing your wife. It was a beautiful picture. Yeah. Beautiful. You should um, get into photography. You're really good at that. I just want to also re rehighlight that thing that we we're talking about. Like, you know, what is it? Two and a half years now. You've been doing this. Is it two and a half two, years. Two and a half yeah. years, right? And so I just want to highlight that. Like, here you are. You're doing it really competently. You're reaching all these people. You're helping all these people, right? 
this is where you said you were going to be. And it took you a while to get there, right? The first shows were a little like you, you were finding your footing. I'm not saying they were bad, but if you look back, you go, oh yeah, I'm doing this much better now. And I'm reaching more people. I'm able to deliver better. But that's where you have to set your expectations in a reasonable way. You can set a goal, but don't think you're going to reach that goal immediately. And I would say, you know, obviously you've been all in, right? You have been incredibly passionate about it. So everything we've talked about is actually played out in this, right? You have this disease of wanting to help people and you'll never get over it, right? It's not such a terrible disease to have, but it's fatal. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to kill you. Under you. But as far as I'm concerned, if we can um, learn about telomeres, which is another topic about our telomeres and our cells and live healthy and all the things John Sarna talks about and all the thing Hanscom talks about and all the thing we're talking about, it's all helps us live longer because we calm ourselves down. We believe we will take one step in front of the other. It's just, you know, the human condition can serve us. Right. It can really it's serve all, us. It's also a struggle when you see truth, right? Like I saw, um, Hanscom saw what I saw, which is the first thing that came out about the Tulsa shootings, the shootings in Tulsa was a guy went in and he killed the doctor because of a failed back surgery, right? The I was, first time in history that ever happened. I don't think so. I'm sure it happened other times, right? But the point is, is that was a lot of rage, right? We, we can that's see- That's discharge. I, I didn't see that on the news here in Israel. It, well, that's that became the headlines the day after Tulsa. And so he wrote a post about it, which was really profound. I saw that, yeah. And also very difficult to write. He actually knew the doctor. He knew the guy. He knew the doctor. And he said he's a nice guy, but he was, you know, he doesn't know what I know, which is that what we're doing is not helping and it's not working and we need to change. And I don't blame him for that, but this is a wake up call. And of course, nobody heard his message except probably you and I, but that is, it's a profound and risky and dangerous thing. So sometimes we have to say the uncomfortable things even when they're uncomfortable, even if they're going to make people mad at us. Yeah, profound. But we only say them to the people who are ready to listen to them because there's no reason to say it to the people who aren't. Right, right. And and, it, and, it's, and when we're saying it, it's not making you to make you feel bad. So we're saying yeah. it with love and compassion. So on that note, have a wonderful rest of the week. We'll you be too. in touch. Thank okay. you to everybody. God bless. Ciao. Have a great uh, afternoon. Bye. Go bananas.